And all God's people said, Amen, at the reading of God's word. And none of you said, Amen. Amen. So thank you. Okay. Come on, how long have you been coming here? So, hey, want to just, some of you don't know, so I'll inform you. Um, I'm, I'm leaving Friday uh, for like a semi-sabbatical, so I will not be here for um, pretty much a month. Uh, there's some guest speakers coming in over the next few weeks. They're newbies, so be real nice to them. Um, if you throw something at them, make sure it's soft, okay? No, um, they're newbies to be, and then, then Pastor Jess will be taking over for the last three weeks that I'm gone. I'm going to the um, Pontifical University in Rome. Um, I'll be there for uh, the month of May. Um, I'll be in a course for the first week I'm there, a course on ministry of exorcism and liberation prayer. Uh, so I'll be there. If you think of me, pray for me. Pray mostly that I don't overeat. Um, Italian, I'm Italian, so Italian food. Um, so that's something that God's been calling me into. When I get back, I have some um, writing projects that I'm working with some other uh, folks and things like that. Um, kind of a ministry that about a year or so I've kind of got called into, dealing with the idea of uh, demonology, spiritual warfare, and things like that. And um, our denominations kind of... Um, that's neat for you and go do that. Um, of course, I'm not funding any of it. So we'll be passing a plate. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I'll be there. So appreciate your prayer. And again, as I'm here, our lead team is engaged. They'll be, you know, keeping track of things and Pastor Jess will be here. Um, so you'll be, you'll be looked after and um, it'll be nice to get back. Um, we we're supposed to take sabbaticals every seven years. I've been in pastoral ministry since 1992. Um, haven't taken one yet, so they're kind of leaning on me to take one. Um, so, um, but so it should be a great time. And no, I'm not going to come back wearing a collar and hailing Mary and things like that. Please don't worry about that. Um, but so it'll be a good time, and it'll be nice to get away and spend some time in prayer and do some writing and stuff like that. So we're going to continue on our study uh, on this idea of. Esther. And we've talked about this. If you've been um, here Wednesday nights, we've talked a lot about where Esther lies, kind of uh, in that time of the, uh, ex, you know, the, the exile. And a lot of the Jews have gone back to Jerusalem. And this is dealing with the Jews who are left in Susa, the capital city. And they're a minority. They're a spiritual group inside of a country where the culture is fragmented and they're kind of odd. They're different. They're in some kind of semi-pluralistic uh, culture, and they're kind of figuring out and still how you function in a fragmented society. That's what we're in. So it's important, and we've been talking about this over the last number of weeks. How do we function as Christians inside the society that we currently live in? Um, and we've processed that and fleshed it out a little bit on Wednesday nights. Um, uh, as we, you know, as we kind of talked about this kind of stuff, but the fr the phrase I want to talk to you about is this idea for such a time as this, and this kind of deals with a really important uh, understanding um, of who our God is. Now, you know, 1990, Bette Midler said that's on God's watching us from a distance. And that's kind of an agnostic concept of who God is. God's far away. God's kind of out there doing his thing, and we're doing our thing. God's kind of taken humanity in the world and kind of wound it up like a watch and just letting it wind down. But that's not the God we see here. It's not the God that we see definitely in the New Testament, but it's not the God that we see here in Esther. For what Mordecai is saying to, to uh, Esther is that you, you might have come to the, to the kingdom for such a time as this is that God puts you in this time and space. God's not out there just wandering around. God is involved in time and space to the degree and to the intimacy that he's placed you right in this situation. Now, Carl Bart writes about this stuff in... Um, Kudos to me as a pastor. I mentioned Carl Bart. Don't read him. He's the kind of person that you read and you get like 70 pages in. You're like, I just have no idea what I just read. But he deals with the idea that God is eminent. God is out there. God is, he's, he's all powerful. He's not like us. He's wholly other. But he's transcendent. 
He went from his eminence, his out there, his otherness, and he stepped right into time and space. And that's what they're saying here. Is that God didn't just step in time and space. God put you in this time and space. And he didn't just do it with Esther. He's done it with you and me. He's placed us in this time and this space for a reason. And what is the reason? The catechism tells us to glorify God in all that we do. What is God's will for you? To glorify Him in this time, in this space that we find ourselves. Galatians 6, 4, talk, uh, sorry, Galatians 4, 5 talks about Jesus coming forth in the fullness of time. And the way that God puts us, the way that why God has put us in fullness in this time and in this space is to be a signpost that points to Him. And that's unique. Because the day and age in which we live in is very unique. Every time and space is unique. You can't step in the same river twice and you can't step in the same time twice because it's moving constantly. But there, I think there is something that's very unique about the time in which we live. And I want to spend a little bit talking about this because it's incredibly important. What's happened over the last number of years because of the way technology has advanced, the way information has moved at the speed of light, is change has taken place very, very quickly. If you're my age, you grew up in a modern world, and the latter part of our lives has turned into this postmodern world. And what's happened in that is there's been a shift in the way we process, the way we view the world, the way we view each other, and the way we view ourselves. And it's important for us, if we're going to live in the time and space and glorify God in it, that we understand what, it's, what the landscape is in the world we live. So we've transformed, we trained very, very quickly from a modern world to a postmodern world, and we've come up with this idea, with this way we view the world today, or the way younger people view the world today. It's very, very different than the way I view the world, and a lot of you view the, view the world. Charles Taylor, the Canadian Catholic philosopher, don't read his books either. I think he's written about one or two of his 30 books that you can actually read. They're really hard to read describes the way our culture has moved and the way we view the world today as expressive individualism. Trevin Wax, in his best way to describe Charles Taylor, a definition of expressive individualism in his book, um, Rethink Yourself, which is a really good book. It's a small read. If you're looking for a book on this kind of stuff, it's very, very good. It's probably only about 100 pages. Charles Taylor's books are like 700 pages. But anyway, he says, the purpose of life, and this is for someone who looks at the world through expressive individualism, which is people probably in their 40s and 30s and, 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 and younger. It says, the purpose of life is to find one's deepest self and then express that to the world, forging that identity in ways that counter whatever family, friends, political affiliations, previous generations, and religious authorities might say. The key here is that the purpose of life is to find one's deepest self and to express that to the world, forging that identity in ways, again, that go counter to those things that were mentioned. Key slogans behind this ideology are you be you, be true to yourself, follow your heart, find yourself. And this differs greatly from past generations. Now, by the way, this is just a reality. You don't fight this. This is just the playing field that we're on. In the time and space that God has put us in, this is the playing field that we're on. Fighting it is, is, is kind of silly. It's like fighting the tide. It's just the reality. It's the common sense of the way people process things now. It's different. 
my generation sought to find, the, find itself by looking out, then looking in, then looking up. I described this before in a sermon almost a year ago. My generation, when they went to find themselves, where did they go? California. That's where everybody went. I told the story about my brother who decided he was going to find himself and hitchhike to California. He got to Pennsylvania and ran out of money and food and the booze wore off and my dad had to go pick him up. Everybody went to California. And my generation, the way you found yourself is you looked out, California, you looked in, and then you looked up. Today, people, they look in. Then they look out. And then they look up to confirm what they've already come to the conclusion of. Do you see how it's different? As Christians, we're called to look up first to God. To look in see our brokenness, and then look out. And this is why you're a parent and you have children. This is why you talk past one another. This is why you're so frustrated. This is why you can't understand each other. As we're programmed differently, we look at the world differently, we look at each other differently, we look at the, 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 the society different. So as Christians in this time and space called to glorify God, how do we do it now that the standards have changed, the world view has changed? How do we do this? How do we embrace this time that we live in, that God's put us in? Now, I come from an Italian background, and Italians are very affectionate. So when I see a cousin, it's normative to hug and kiss them. And if it's an aunt, she hugs, kisses you, and then she grabs your face. And that's normal. And friends would come over to my house, they'd meet a cousin, and he would, and they're not getting used to getting hugged and kissed, and they would do the headbutt or the nose would hit each other, or they'd go to kiss each other and they'd like. Touch the lips. It's you know, and and it was awkward because they didn't know how to embrace one another. I dare to say that's how many of us feel today. If you're my age, you don't know how to embrace. It's awkward. Sometimes you just don't like it. It's gross or something. How do we embrace and glorify God in the time and space we live? I think we see some keys here from Esther, and we know that she's a signpost pointing us to Christ. The first thing we must do if we're going to embrace to glorify God with the people who we live around, our neighbors, is we always need to take a posture of peace. Esther is not looking for a fight. She's not looking for a fight. The fight comes to her. And matter of fact, even when the fight comes to her, she's like, "Uh, I just won't say anything. And Mordecai is like, oh, no, you won't. You don't say anything. Bad things are going to happen. They force her hand. She gets pushed into this battle. She doesn't run into it. And when we start to deal and try to embrace the people around us, we need to take a posture of peace. We all know the story of the Sons of Thunder. Where Jesus is going through Samaria, and they don't want Jesus to come into town, and they're not nice to him. They don't come out to greet him, and the disciples are like, okay, can we call down fire on them? And Jesus is like, yeah, let's barbecue them. Jesus looks at them and rebukes them. And in one of the accounts, he's like, you have no idea what I'm like. Our God didn't come to judge the world. He came to be judged for the world. And if we're going to serve God and glorify God in this time and space where God has put us on this planet, planet, we need to know how to embrace those who are around us and posture ourselves with a posture of peace 
and humility. You know what it says in Isaiah about the Messiah? It said, a bruised reed he will stomp to death, and a smoking flax he will put out. No. It says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not blow out. It says that little tender reed that's been bruised, that just wants to fall over. The gentleness of the Messiah can heal that. The, how fragile that thing is. And a little smoking. Have you ever tried to light a fire and you got a little ember and you, you dare not blow on it because it's about to go out? It says, our, our, our Messiah is gentle enough not to snuff that out. Because he comes to be judged, not judged. He comes in a posture of peace. He comes not to win an argument, but to win a soul. He didn't come wielding a sword like Peter. But he came and he took one in the side for humanity. And that society in which we live. God says, come in peace, be gentle, and be willing, but take it on the chin. For their soul. That's how we glorify God. We must learn to act and not react. Exeter, she's she's got you know, she she hears this what's going to happen, and she's got a date of when this is going to go down. Haman set it up December thirteenth. What's going to happen is all your neighbors get to kill the Jews. They get to take their stuff, and then they got to pay tax on it. She knows the date. She knows the clock's ticking, but she's not hurried. And she begins to plan. She's not running around the palace with her hair on fire. No, she's planning. And she understands what the plan is. She's like, I got to get to that king. And we need to understand that God has called us to act and not react. One of the things you read... When you go through the Gospels, is Jesus is not hurried at all. He's never running here and running there. Matter of fact, they try to get him moving. They're like, everybody in the city wants to talk to you. Would you wake up? Would you get going? And he's like, yeah, let's go to the next town. And they're like, no, there's all these people out here. And he's like, we're done here. They don't set my agenda. God does. And as we learn to act and we not react, we realize that in Ecclesiastes 7 where, 7, where it tells us there's a time to speak and a time to stay silent, sometimes the best thing we can do is just be there. And if you don't know what to say, sometimes it's best not to say anything. Don't react, just act. And that's really hard. But there's grace for that. Next is we must also risk negative repercussions. Esther's like, if I go uninvited into the king, that's a capital offense. If I storm in there, I could, I could lose my head or worse. And all of us want to be accepted and appreciated and loved and go through our lives, you know, unmolested and unaffected by other people. But that's not the world we live in. We all love this concept of comfort and we don't want, you know, anxiety. We don't want the difficulty that comes sometimes. 
But sometimes we need to risk negative repercussions. Jesus was rejected by the nation. He came to save his family, his friends, and eventually his father. I was raised Roman Catholic. I was confirmed Roman Catholic, and a year after that, I became a Protestant Christian and became, in those days, they called a born-again Christian. I never told any of my friends. I was too embarrassed. I thought they would make fun of me, and I was really afraid of that whole turn-the-other-cheek thing because I was afraid they would take advantage of it. Sorry. So I never told my friends, and I, I would always, like, you know, I'd go to church and stuff, and it was always on the down low. I had this little pocket Bible. It folded up into look like a wallet, and it was something that I kind of hid. And I remember getting into a situation where I really needed my friends to step up for me and be there for me. And none of them did it. And I remember sitting there, scared to death, feeling betrayed, feeling just... And I said to God, I'm all alone. And I honestly sensed in my heart, no, you're not. I'm still here. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're here. And when we're a Christian, you might need to know this. You never go anywhere alone. Wherever you go, God is already there. Our God doesn't take vacations. Our God is present. He's here. Right next to you. And when we understand that, rejections still hurt. They're still painful. But they're not devastating. Because our Savior went to the cross and was totally rejected for us. And in so doing, he could say to us, I will never, ever leave you or forsake you. You could do the most rotten thing. You could do the dumbest thing. And I am still present with you. So rejection, when it comes down to that, we realize, I know God's going to be with me. <laughs> Esther went into the king at the, at the risk of her life. Jesus went to the cross at the cost of his life. Very, very different. Next, what we see there is Mordecai says to Esther, if you don't do what God wants you to do, God will raise up somebody else to do it. And we must realize, and I'll reiterate this, is we must remember we're never alone. We're not alone in this. And I, I use that through the last to topic with the idea of God. But we need to realize that God has got other people around us too. Elijah, he, he goes off into the wilderness, and, and, and God and him have this incredible conversation. Elijah is leaving ministry. He gets rid of his, his servant, he gets, and he is shedding all the remnants of, of, of his ministry, and he's in the wilderness, and God is like, what are you doing here? And he's like, I was zealous for God. And I am all alone. 
I'm all alone. And God's like, no, you're not. And by the way, on Mount Carmel, he said in front of them, I'm alone, and you've got 450 prophets of Baal. And now he's in the wilderness, he's saying to God, I'm all alone. And God's like, no, you're not. There are 7,000 people who have not bent their knee to Baal. Elijah is surrounded by an army. And his servant is flipping out. And he says, more who are with us than against us. And he's like, dude, it's you and me. And there's an army in front of us. And he prays, God, open his eyes. And he sees what's really there. He sees through reality into ultimate reality. And he sees the chariots of God, the mountains full of angelic beings. We're not alone. We have God, the church, and angelic beings on our side. Only a small percentage of the angels fell. Majority are still on our side. I'll expound more on that when I get back from Rome. But anyway... That was a joke, okay? Come on. Lighten up. So what are we supposed to do that we're in this time, and, and, and how do we now connect as we begin to do these things? It says that we're to offer, and this is what Mordecai says to Esther, that if you don't do it, God will bring relief and deliverance from another hand. There's this idea where she's supposed to bring relief and deliverance. And through an idea for us, we are supposed to be ministering relief and deliverance to those in our communities who yet know Christ. This idea of of, of relief is interesting. The King James um, refers to it as enlargement. And and, and that's kind of more what it means in in the original Hebrew. It comes to the idea of flourishing or multiplicity or multiplication. And when we think about our faith and we think about how the world sees what the gospel does or what religion does, it's all about restriction and confinement. When I become a Christian, I can't do this. When I can become a Christian, I can't do that. And even when the Holy Spirit came down in the book of Acts, what did they compare it to? They're drunk. What happens to you when you get drunk? The world becomes smaller. It's a constriction. That's why we like it. We have all these worries and we get loaded and then what happens? The world becomes smaller. And then what do we start doing? We start singing to a red solo cup. I love you. All right? That's what what drunkenness does. It constricts you. What's the Holy Spirit do? The exact opposite. It expands us. It lets us see from reality into ultimate reality. It enlarges our field of vision to we see through reality, ultimate reality, and then we see God. It's the concept of flourishing. And then we're to bring deliverance. Becoming a Christian is not just changing your mind, even though that's part of it. It's not just accepting an idea that makes you a little bit better. It's actually being delivered from being a servant and a slave to Satan to becoming a child of God. Before you become a Christian, you have a ruler. It says your heart is full of darkness. You're totally depraved. Your God 
you might think is you, but is Satan. And what does Satan say? Your life, your life for me. What does Satan say? You go make bricks. And if you don't like it, I'll make you make them without straw. And don't you cheat the till. Because if you do, I'll whip you with scorpions. We're to bring deliverance for people who are living under that lash. And bring them into the knowledge of what Jesus Christ did. Our God, the most powerful, and who says, my life for you. You're no longer a slave. You're a child. I don't hit you with a lash. I took the lash for you. I won't beat you even when you do something stupid or evil. I took that beating for you. I won't say your life for me, but I'll give my life for you. That's what we're called to do in this world. That's why God has put us in this place at at this time. To understand the burden that people are living under right now. Expressive individualism means your whole life, from your identity to every choice, it's all up to you. Do you know what that burden is? Do we wonder why anxiety meds are flying off the shelves? Because your life is all determined by you and you alone. That is an incredible burden to live under. Expressive individualism says, it's all up to you. And you're living under that burden. And we get called to share with them the good news of Christ and bring them relief and deliverance. Well, here's some next steps for this coming week. This week, I will ask God to forgive me and be Lord of my life. If you've never been a Christian or maybe you've been to church a long time or maybe it's your first time here, the first time you've ever heard the gospel, that's you check that. And if you want to talk about it, if I'm still here, I'll talk to you about it, but I'd love to talk to you about it. So check that. Or maybe this is you. This week I'll ask God, show me where I'm show me where I'm I may in, minister relief and deliverance. Ask God where God wants you to be present and minister his relief and deliverance. If that's you, check that. Or maybe this is you. This week, I'll ask God, help me risk rejection. Show me where you want to go, where you want me to go. Show me what you want me to do. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your continued goodness and mercy to each and every one of us. Thank you for all that you've done for us. And Lord, as we are here today and we're kind of caught in the disorientation of how our world has changed so much and continues to change, help us to be effective in the time and space where you've placed us. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You're on? I should have.